Hello everyone, my name is Elizabeth, the Education Coordinator for Marlene's Market in Delhi. Tonight's special guest we have with us is Linda Frank. She is a National Board um, a Certified Reflexologist. She is also the founder and director of Reflexology Academy Northwest located here in Tacoma, Washington and um, also is a licensed massage therapist and has a plethora of other certifications and um, expertise to share with you this evening. And um, her topic is Your Fascinating Heart, the correlation of how reflexology can help support your heart health. Let's give a warm welcome to Linda Frank, yay! Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and it is great to be here. I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to bring this information to you. So um, I think what I'll do is uh, launch right into my PowerPoint presentation. So I'm going to share my screen here. Okay. So um, when you hear the word heart, just take a moment to Think about what word or words come to mind to you. You might even want to jot something down. So the heart is long associated with, and I have to move my little picture over here, love, right? It may be um, the most common association. Courage, brave heart right? The center or the essence or the core of a matter, the heart of the issue is a head of lettuce, right? Oftentimes called a heart. The fourth chakra in the energy system of the body, the seat of emotion and a pump. The origin of the heart is a symbol. Um, this is one theory. There was an ancient, ancient plant called sylphium. It was a giant, giant fennel uh, grown in what's now Libya. And it was used as a perfume, a spice, a hair tonic, and a pain medication. But the Romans used it as a contraceptive, which may have led to its popularity as an ideograph of the heart shape. And here is a silver coin. Uh, depicting the seed of the silicon plant, silicium plant. And you can see that obviously it's heart-shaped. Now the heart is indeed a pump. I know in the brief description, I said the heart is more than just a pump. It is still a pump. It beats slightly more than once a minute, about a hundred thousand times a day. And each cycle of blood through the body takes about a minute. That's still pretty quick when you think of getting blood down to your tippy toes and back up again. There are four chambers to the heart. And usually we see the heart in this sort of laid out in this one dimensional, uh, the two atria left and right and two ventricles. But the heart is actually a spiral. It's a bundle of cardiac muscles and it's a, a spiral helix that, um, that is very efficient at pumping blood. And I'm gonna, I have to, unfortunately, this is the only way to get you to a YouTube video. I have to stop share and then share again and go to my, um, somewhere here is this wonderful video. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll get it. Okay, sorry. It's just a little couple of screens there that I have to switch on and off to. That's just the way Zoom is. It doesn't make it easy for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Try this share again. Okay. So this is an opportunity for you to see, and this is a, the heart of a, of a cow, um, but it's desiccated, it's dried out. So it's not gory or anything, but it, it just shows you um, 
the spiral uh, nature the of the heart. three dimensional structure responsible for this motion has perplexed anatomists for over 500 years and was considered the Gordian knot of anatomy. The solution to this dilemma was proposed by a Spanish cardiologist and anatomist named Francisco or Paco Torrent Wasp, shown during his early years and during his later years before his recent passing. Torrent Wasp proposed a simple solution by demonstrating that the heart muscle architecture was modeled like a single rope that could be folded or wrapped into a figure of eight shape. This configuration explains the observed spiral motion. Paco understood that nature is simple, but realized that scientists are complicated. <laughs> Above is the conical heart, and below is the rope-like model just discussed. Using only hand dissection, the pulmonary artery is detached from the aorta, and the musculature is unwrapped. The helical-shaped fibers are encircled by a muscle with mainly horizontal fibers, and the rope unfolds in the same way. Both left and right ventricles are surrounded by these transverse fibers, much like buttresses of classic churches, which support the Gothic dome. The muscle contains a central fold that directs the fibers obliquely downward toward the cardiac apex. The apical vortex is unwrapped to show an apical loop until the unfold. I'm going to fast forward a little. Oh, the artery is removed from the aorta. Following this, the external basal loop is unwrapped to expose the cone configuration, which contains a helical design. Next, the conical part is separated into outer and inner segments, which, after unwinding, displays how the unwrapped heart looks like a simple rope that is uncoiled. This dissection is now brought to life. The yellow colors show the sequential movements that define normal cardiac motion. This image demonstrates how the external wrap narrows the ventricle while the inner cone twists to eject and then untwists to suck. So I just wanted to, um, to uh, hope that you might marvel as I do at the, um, at the wonderful um, shape of our heart, whoops, I have to, sorry, get out of this. And back to share. Um, at the marvel, at the architecture of the heart, it's, it's really quite remarkable um, that it is this um, long line of muscle fiber twisted into a spiral to give it the torque to be able to push our blood all the way through the body. Um, trees may grow in spirals to better survive windstorms and distribute energy. So you can see the spiraling here of this tree. This was taken on Mount Tahoma. But it's more than, um, than just the heart that pumps. It would be physically impossible for a relatively small heart to pump a viscous fluid through roughly 100,000 miles of vessels keeping in mind that the circumference of the earth at the equator is approximately 25,000 miles. So we're talking about four times around the earth. That's how many miles of vessels we have. And we have smooth muscles in our arteries that help control the diameter and thereby the flow of blood. Um, these vessels are also believed to have a perist what we call a peristaltic movement. That's what we usually refer to as the movement in the bowels that pushes fecal matter along. Similarly, it's believed that the vessels have this peristaltic movement to help move blood along. In reflexology, we call the calves the second heart. And that's because when we walk, we have to flex our calves and that motion helps to push what we call the venous blood, the blood that's in the veins, that's gonna go back to the heart, the calf muscles, and all of our muscles actually help to push blood back to the heart and thereby take the strain off the heart, having to pull this uh, blood all the way up from the feet. So these high heels might look terrific, and I have a video, if we have time, I'll show it. I'm not gonna take the time right now to go back and forth, but you will see when, when a woman walks in high heels like this, there's no calf movement whatsoever. 
Same thing with shoes that don't have a back. There's no calf movement because someone is spending all their time gripping their toes to hold on to those shoes. So we really want shoes with a back that are flat, that enable us to use our second heart. So I just had to throw that in there as a reflexologist, I feel bound to include that information. So besides being a pump, what else is the heart? It forms the strongest magnetic field, 5,000 times stronger than the one produced by the brain. Okay, and it's the strongest uh, de information dense force field known to physics. It's reasonable to suggest, therefore, that the heart's magnetic field plays an important role for the overall communication of the body. EM, or electromagnetic fields, are formed whenever electrically charged particles, ions, move about. For instance, there's something called the sodium potassium pump, and I don't have time to go into any of that um, physiology here, but suffice it to say the heart's magnetic field affects not only the rest of the body, but they say it tends to radiate a distance of more or less three feet. I've seen figures quoting up to 13 feet. So our heart, our magnetic field radiated from our heart can be perceived by others. There's also a heart-mind connection. So this blue uh, wave shown here is, uh, is the mother's electroencephalograph, so her EEG or her brain wave. And you can see that it's matching her infant's heart wave or EKG. Most of us have had an EKG, which measures uh, the pulse of our heart or the signal of our heart. So you can see they're in pretty close resonance. The heart was categorized as a sensory organ. Um, and that was actually back in 1985. So our normal sensory organs are eyes, ears, nose, mouth, touch, right? And I want to add to that the feet, because the feet are also a sensory organ. And I'm a reflexologist, so I work with the feet. Um, and uh, they are sensory organs that my understanding is they develop in utero at the same time as our other sensory organs. These are what we call proprioceptors. So they are telling our nervous system, our brain, where we are in space, okay? Giving feedback about our balance. Are we upright? The heart was considered the most important body organ for the Egyptian civilization. They believed it's where the mind and the soul were located. And after someone died, the heart was weighed on a scale against the feather of Ma'at. This was an ostrich feather. An average ostrich feather weighs about 2.5 ounces. The average heart, and that's one that's not filled with blood, it's one I looked at cadaver statistics, is 3.7 to 22 ounces. So I think most hearts would weigh heavier than the ostrich feather. But if the heart balanced with the feather, then the deceased was declared justified. If the heart was heavier than the feather, and this site that I looked at said uh, weighty with wickedness, uh, then it was swallowed by a soul feeder. But I think it could be also that the heart could be weighty with regrets, okay? According to the Heart Math Institute, the heart sends more signals to the brain than the brain sends signals to the heart. Oops. Sorry. Oh. Eighty <laughs> percent. So one way that the heart sends signals to the vein, to the brain, is through the vagus nerve, which is called the wanderer. And here you can see, this is a cranial nerve that originates in the brain. It comes down through the neck. It goes through the diaphragm and it goes to the heart and lungs. 
it goes to the liver, it goes to the stomach, it goes to the kidneys, it goes, the vagus nerve also innervates much of the large intestine, okay? So it's called the wanderer because it goes to many places in the body. And it regulates many critical aspects of human physiology, including heart rate, blood pressure, sweating, digestion, and even speaking. And I highlighted speaking because I remember from years and years ago, uh, Prevention Magazine had an article about blood pressure um, going up when people spoke. So the recommendation was when you're at the doctor and you're having your blood pressure taken, don't be chit-chatting away because speaking raises your blood pressure. And so I think it's interesting now as I learn about the association of the, of the heart to the vagus nerve um, and the vagus nerve regulating even speaking, um, it's a nice, interesting um, connection. It sort of closes that circle for me. So this is the vagus nerve coming down through the neck. And when I was in massage school in 1980, we learned that um, an African tribe, I'm not sure which one, um, that was a long time ago. I don't hold on to all that information, but I do remember being told that they would stroke the side of the neck to help lower blood pressure or calm someone down. So um, now again, learning about the vagus nerve, it's interesting, I wonder if that's what they were impacting. I always thought of it as impacting the carotid artery, which runs through the neck. Um, but it could be that they were kind of stroking or coaxing that vagus nerve to relax. Now the vagus nerve um, is the nerve that is most associated with what we call the parasympathetic nervous system. So, um, so it's involved with what we call rest and digest. And I add to that repair. It's, it's your downtime, it's your body's downtime, the vagus nerve. The, the uh, opposite is the sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight or flight. We all may have heard of that term, fight or flight. The body releases adrenaline. Our heart gets pumping really fast. Blood is rushing out to our muscles and we're ready to either fight or flight or, or flee. Or the third part of that, according to polyvagal theory, Stephen Porges' polyvagal theory, um, is that freeze is a third state that happens. And that's a whole interest, really interesting um, subject. But for now, just to know that the vagus nerve slows things down, enables us to digest our food well, slows our heart rate down. This is a book that some whom I've shared it with have said it's, it's like the most important book they've ever seen. Um, Stanley Rosenberg is a body worker. Um, he has created this book that has some exercises. And um, please be daunted not by the title that says for anxiety, depression, trauma, and autism. Healing the accessing power, the accessing the healing power of the vagus nerve is for everybody because it will help, it can help you to go into a really relaxed state in a matter of seconds. No kidding. We're gonna do it. Okay, so the basic exercise, and I will show you a video after we do it ourselves, just to sort of further cement this, because it can be one of the most important things you can learn. You can go into a bathroom stall somewhere and do this in, again, under two minutes. So this helps people move from a state of stress or shutdown to more calm, healthy, and functional state of the nervous system. It helps to reposition the first and second cervical, that's the neck vertebrae, increases mobility in the neck and the entire spine and increases blood flow to the brainstem where the cranial nerves originate. So what we're gonna do is first, we're gonna test our range of motion. We're gonna get a good idea of how far we can turn to the left. Whoops, that's my left. And how far we can turn to the right. So everybody go ahead and do that. Just notice how you comfortably, how far your head goes as you comfortably turn it to the side. Now we're gonna interlace our fingers 
and rest them. Go ahead and rest your head in the cradle of your interlaced fingers. And now with moving just your eyes, your head's gonna wanna go along. Mm -mm. Keep your head straight ahead and just move your eyes to the left until you yawn, sigh, or swallow. So just your eyes, your head staying straight ahead till you yawn, sigh, or swallow. I'm gonna give it a minute. You do this for up to a minute. And I wanna make sure since I can't really see you all, I wanna make sure everyone has an opportunity to experience this. I saw one yawn, I saw two yawns, good. And then when, when you have yawn, sighed or swallow, go ahead and just rest your eyes straight ahead and you can just envision something beautiful while we're waiting. You might have a nice memory of being in the outdoors or being with some friends or family members, make it as vivid as you can, sort of relive the scene. That in and of itself is relaxing. Okay, and now go ahead and turn, close, excuse me, keeping your eyes either open or closed, keeping your head straight ahead, turn just your eyes to the right until you yawn, sigh, or swallow. And if you've yawned, sighed, or swallowed, go ahead and you can take your hands down and just relax, take a couple of nice deep breaths. I'm just going to give everyone an opportunity. And sometimes people ask, I'm not. I'm not yawning. I'm not sighing. I'm not swallowing. That's okay. The more you do this exercise, you'll find the yawn, sigh, or swallow starts to come on faster and faster and faster until sometimes now I just start moving my eyes to the left or right and the yawn or the sigh will come on. So despair not. It's, it's, um, it's something that your system, that you can help your system to do, to get used to doing. Okay. And now turn to the left and just notice if you can turn your head a little farther. Come back to center and turn the other way to the right. So hopefully you've experienced some additional range of motion. I see some yeses, some nods. And if you, if you just stick your fingers in the, what we call the occipital area, so at the base of your skull, if you just take your fingers and stick them sort of in there with just a little bit of pressure and just move your eyes around, you might feel your muscles moving. You might feel movement back there. This is a, again, a terrific way to get yourself um, into a, rest and digest state. Um, I'm gonna, I'll stop share and show you the video. Oops, no, oh shoot. I gotta come back to, okay, there we go. So here we go. I just want, would like to reinforce this so that you have Hi, an everyone. opportunity. I'm from here. I'm going to describe in a very short clip how to do the basic exercise by Stanley Rosenberg, uh, as described in his book, Accessing the Healing Power of the Vagus Nerve. Uh, I'll put some links below uh, so you can have more references. But this is just to describe how to do the exercise, which is very simple and will take only a couple of minutes. So before you start the actual exercise, you want to sit upright, comfortably upright. And you want to just turn your head from side to side, just very gently. Turn your head from side to side. And just notice how it feels. So see if it feels like you have even movement to the right and the left and see if one side feels more restricted 
maybe have pain, limitation. If you do feel pain or even discomfort, maybe try to give it a number from one to 10. So let's say I turn my head to the right and I feel a restriction, little discomfort, and I would call it five out of 10. So that at the end of the exercise, you can try to do the same thing again. And then maybe, hopefully, you feel a reduction in the pain or the discomfort and you feel more freedom of movement. So here's the exercise, super simple. Please lie on your back. I'm going to do it sitting up, but please lie on your back, especially in the first few times that you, you do the exercise and interlock your fingers and place them against the back of your head. So you're lying on your back, you're comfortable, you're resting and your hands are behind your head. While you're there, feel the weight of your head sitting in your fingers and have a sensation of your fingers at the back of the head. So a moment of awareness just to that position. Then very important, keeping your head centered, turn only the eyeballs to look to the right. So only the eyes turn to the right as far as you can go comfortably. And then you stay there like this. So you're going to keep the eyeballs to the right and you're going to keep your head exactly centered for up to a minute, maybe 30 seconds to a minute. While you're there in this position, looking to the side, you may feel a spontaneous yawn or a sigh or a swallow. If you feel that, slowly bring your eyes back to center. If you don't feel that, it's fine. You will probably feel it next time or the time after when you practice the exercise. At the end of the minute, bring the eyeballs back to center. Take a moment here in the center and then turn the eyes. Just the eyes turn the other way. You stay there. The head is centered. The eyes are looking to the left and you stay there for 30 seconds up to a minute. And again, if during that time you feel a spontaneous yawn, or a sigh or a swallow, take it as a sign to bring your eyes back to center, then stay there for another few moments and slowly sit yourself up again, make yourself comfortable, try not to slouch, but sit upright so that your upper body is organized properly. And again, just look to the side slowly and just observe the differences. That's it, that's the basic exercise, super easy to do. Okay, and back to my PowerPoint. So, um, so hopefully that really gave you um, an additional opportunity to learn this. The, uh, the exercise is in the book, uh, Accessing the Healing Power of the Vagus Nerve by Stanley Rosenberg. There's a second exercise as well to work the muscle that's alongside the vagus nerve and that's a muscle that controls the trapezius muscle. Some people call them the traps, uh, the big kite shaped muscle, and also the muscle of your neck, the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So, um, so there are additional exercises in the book as well as wonderful descriptions about the vagus nerve. Swallowing is another way to activate the vagus nerve. And water comprises about 70% of our body. Water hydrates our fascia. Uh, fascia is the, the wrapping, as you can see, it's like a spider web that covers our entire body. It covers our muscles, it covers our tendons, it covers our ligaments, it covers individual muscle fibers, it covers our heart. So in the heart, it's called the pericardium. The fascia is believed to convey messages faster than nerves can. Some call the fascia the 13th body system because it, they believe it is the, the interlocutor. It's the, the messenger that enables different body systems to talk to one another. We're now learning so much about fascia. We're learning so much about the body. I have a beautiful uh, short YouTube video. I'm not gonna show it just yet. I'll wait till the end if we have time. Um, but Elizabeth, will there be a way to share these links like on the Facebook page below? 
the replay, that would be great. Yes, definitely. Okay, great. So that if we don't have time to show it tonight, um, I can show it at another time. So here we are seeing the heart and the pericardium that blends right into the muscle of the diaphragm. Okay, the diaphragm is the muscle kind of below your rib cage and it's the breathing muscle. So when we breathe, the diaphragm comes, it's a, it's a dome shape. And when we breathe, it comes down. It actually massages our liver and our stomach. Okay, because those organs sit below it, but above it, when we relax, when we exhale, we're giving the, the heart and lungs a little massage. Okay, I've got this little malfunction here in my... So conscious breathing is another way to engage the vagus nerve. Also because the vagus nerve goes through the diaphragm. So, so conscious breathing has, serves a twofold purpose. It's massaging the heart, it's attached to the pericardium. So it's giving the heart a little massage, getting more oxygenated blood, some nutrients um, around the heart but also it's, um, it's a way to engage the vagus nerve. You, you cannot be in fight or flight when you're doing deep relaxing breathing. So taking a breathing break is a, a really nice way to engage the parasympathetic nervous system. I don't like to stay, say stimulate, be, although it is stimulating it, but stimulate sort of has that connotation of more the fight and flight. Deep diaphragmatic breathing will also give your heart an opportunity to receive abundant blood supply. Okay, so most of us, many of us spend a lot of our day hunched over, right? We want to give the heart some space, some physical space um, by, by sitting up and doing some of this deep breathing. In addition to my recommendation for the Vegas Nerve book by Stanley Rosenberg, I highly recommend this book, Breath, by James Nestor. It was on the New York Times bestseller list for some time. It's got loads of really interesting stories about breath. And in the back of the book, it has um, numerous um, breathing techniques that are quite wonderful for us to, um, to be aware of. And you might wanna try some of them out. Now, um, one of the breathing techniques uh, that Dr. Andrew Weil recommends is uh, a four, seven, eight breath. And Dr. Andrew Weil, for those who aren't familiar with him, he's a Harvard trained uh, MD um, and who spent a lot of time in the jungles of South America studying botanicals as well. So he's, he brings an interesting mix of Western perspective and what some would call alternative or complementary perspective. In fact, he was the forerunner of complementary and integrative medicine. He has convinced about 50 medical schools to, to start teaching at least about the complementary modalities like reflexology, like acupuncture, like chiropractic, like massage. Um, at, in hopes that the doctors of tomorrow will be a little bit more open to um, collaborating with complementary practitioners um, and of uh, encouraging their, their patients to, um, to have some of those modalities, engage with some of those modalities if they find value in them. And for a lot of people, the value in some of the complementary modalities is more time is spent than, than with a doctor. And oftentimes with a doctor, you can only take one um, complaint in at a time. Um, so um, yeah, so Dr. Andrew Weil recommends, and I'm, let's do it now. It's a four, seven, eight breath. 
So what he has you do is you breathe in for the count of four. I'll explain it first and then let's all do it together. In for the count of four, hold for the count of seven, and then exhale to the count of eight. Now you notice maybe we are gonna be inhaling half as much or for half as much time as we're gonna be exhaling. And that is because the more we, the deeper we exhale, then the next breath that we take in is gonna be a deeper breath, even though we're only pulling it in for a count of four. So let's go ahead and just take a moment. You can keep your eyes open, you can close your eyes and just breathe in two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, breathe in, two, three, four, and hold, three, four, five, six, seven, exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and inhale, three, four, hold, three, four, five, six, seven, exhale, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you get a sense of the rhythm of it. Um, hopefully you had an opportunity to experience the deeper inhale after holding for the count of eight. The heart was also discovered. So, so just the simple things of deep breathing has so, and drinking water, so, 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 so many benefits for us. The heart was also discovered to be an endocrine gland. And this was actually in the 1980s. Um, so we, when I learned back in massage school in 1980, the endocrine glands, uh, they were the pituitary, the pineal gland, the thyroid, the thymus, the adrenals that sit on top of the kidneys, right? That reduce adrenaline, that fight or flight. The pancreas, which reduce, which um, uh, secretes insulin. The ovaries, the testes, okay? The placenta is also an endocrine gland, but it's temporary in pregnant women. Um, but now the heart, now we know that not only the heart is an endocrine gland, but we also now know that other organs um, release hormones, which are what endocrine glands produce. They produce hormones, which are chemicals that cause changes in our system. So our nervous system is really causes fast changes and the endocrine system, the endocrine organs release hormones that have a slower, tend to have a slower, but a longer lasting impact on the body. So um, there is the heart now uh, was found to uh, really secrete ANF, atrial natriuretic factor, which lowers blood pressure, uh, relaxes arterioles, those are the smaller arteries, and affects other blood pressure hormones like ren renin and angiotensin. So kind of interesting, the heart now discovered to be an endocrine gland, now we're discovering, um, in fact, I just saw an article. Um, we, we, when I was originally taught anatomy and physiology, we were taught that the stomach had its own wrapping around it. The pancreas had its own wrapping. The liver, it was a separate organ. Um, these are all separate organs. Now they're um, considering it one system. So the mesentery, which is some of the wrapping around the organs, that there's no differentiation. Um, the mesentery of one organ tends to flow right into the other, right into the other, right into the other. Um, so it, similarly with our discovery of fascia, the wrappings around the muscles, um, 
it's either Tom Myers, uh, who works a lot with fascia, or John Barnes, who created the system myofascial release, um, says, are there really 600 muscles in the body, or is there one muscle in, wrapped in 600 fascial uh, wrappings? So we're really um, coming away from a reductionist kind of point of view and looking at the body more holistically. It's been discovered also that the heart also produces oxytocin, which is called the nursing hormone. It's one that tends to engender trust. Dopamine, which is responsible for the pleasure and reward uh, system in our body. And we know that um, dopamine is largely like serotonin, which is the, um, the mood, um, uh, neurotransmitter. Um, both dopamine and serotonin are largely produced in the intestines. So they're doing a lot of work with um, probiotics um, that can uh, impact depression. Um, and the heart can release noradrenaline in addition to the, um, the adrenal glands, which were Previously, that they were the only ones considered to release adrenaline, I think. I mean, that's at least how I learned it. So there's something called, in terms of emotions, um, there's something called broken heart syndrome. And um, it happens when people are exposed to large doses of adrenaline, like someone dying suddenly. Um, can create a broken heart syndrome, but most people um, respond um, and uh, rebound very quickly. Some of the additional things we think of that help contribute to a healthy heart, food, right? Exercise, companionship, friendship, Monitoring our blood pressure, maybe getting um, the, the care of a doctor. Uh, Mediterranean diet. So fish, legumes, vegetables. Impressive study from the University of Athens. This was in the New England Journal of Medicine found that people who ate a Mediterranean style diet had a 33% reduction in the risk of death from heart disease. That's pretty significant. Um, and this other heart study found that within four years, the Mediterranean diet reduced the rates of heart disease recurrence and cardiac death among patients who'd already had a heart attack by a whopping 50 to 70%. And reflexology has been shown to help with heart health. So a Spanish physician who's used reflexology in his medical practice for about 40 years did a research study with, uh, for high blood pressure, and they were able to reduce the dosage of, um, of medication by half. And reflexology also simply helps by virtue of helping the body to normalize what we say normalize function. So one thing that we do is, again, like the vagus nerve, we're impacting, we're asking the body to go into fight, uh, in, from fight or flight into rest and digest. Rest and digest is also called feed and breed. So if, you know, in, in terms of someone trying to conceive, um, doing that, if you want to conceive, try that vagus nerve eye movement exercise to put your body into rest and digest feed and breed. Um, and reflexology can also aid circulation and nerve supply to organs and glands. That's a wonderful thing about reflexology is we can work organs and glands um, in addition to just the, not just, but in addition to muscles um, and tendons. So reflexology, I'm just going to say a couple things about it based um, on the belief that there are maps on the hands, feet, and outer ears. So we apply firm and gentle alternating pressure to those points in order to help the body to normalize. We're working through the nervous system. 
We send a message up, the body sends a message down. Reflexology isn't a substitute or alternative for standard medical care, but a complement to it. We are called a CAM modality, CAM, complementary and alternative medicine. Again, like chiropractic and Reiki and acupuncture, massage. Um, but uh, the Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine has changed their name to the Center for, for Complementary and Integrative Medicine. So we're moving away from that word alternative. We don't mean to present ourselves as an alternative to medical care, but as a complement to it. So modern ref reflexology actually originated in, in the American medical system. It was an ear, nose, and throat physician around 1919, 1909 who was looking for something analgesic while he was doing procedures on patients. And he mapped 10 zones in the body. And then from there, it developed uh, into horizontal zones as well. And then the map that we see today, looks like a map is missing. Okay, well, um, the ear map is based on fetal positioning and in part on embryological development. So here you see that what would be the fetus in the womb. It's a little easier to visualize with a adult person. So the only place in the body where the vagus nerve comes external is in the ear. So we can hold this point in the ear. Now, it is located before the ear canal, right? And toward the upper part of what we call the concha, this large area, let me get a pointer. Um, this large, see if I can do this before the ear canal, okay? But since the heart reflex is straight in on this broad area, uh, Noget, who is the French physician who mapped the, what we call the European ear points, he says, you press anywhere in that area, you're going to be getting the vagus nerve. So don't worry so much if you don't have the exact spot. Okay. Right about there. So sitting at a traffic light, you can just stick your finger one, you know, I, I typically do one at a time. So somebody doesn't kind of look at me sideways. Um, I had heard about a study. So this is the heart reflex. I had heard about a study that was done with arrhythmia um, of just pressing in straight in for a minute on that heart reflex. And I, I would have occasions of arrhythmia. By the way, if someone has arrhythmia, please see a doctor. Do not just do this because if you have arrhythmia regularly, it can be very dangerous because the, when the blood pauses in the heart chamber before it gets ready to to pump again, that's the, the beat, the skipped beat, um, that blood can clot. And so then it can shoot a clot to your heart, to your lungs, to your brain. So if you have a serious arrhythmia, please see a medical physician, but it, or a doctor, but um, I had some periods of bumpiness of my heart and, and I would do this again at traffic lights. I'd be driving to work and I'd just stick my finger in my ear and um, it really seemed to quell the the bumps so um so again uh just for temporary use um but in the kind of in the vicinity of the vagus nerve but this is a fabulous point again that you can access if you're feeling you know sort of all over the place fight or flight um try just holding this point for 20 or 30 seconds or until it just you know, it, it can start to feel really delicious. Um, so there's no set time frame that you have to do it for. Another really nice reflexology point to use is what we call the solar plexus point. I call it palm calm. In fact, I trademarked it as palm calm. 
So it's located between the second and third finger and it's where the crease is, okay? So that's palm calm. You can hold it with your thumb. You can hold it with your finger. I used to put myself back to sleep with this point. So if I'd wake up at 3 a.m. or something, I'd just hold palm calm. And another way to work this is to stick your, you can stick your fingers in, put your fingers in the crease to help you breathe deep. So this is the diaphragm line where the crease is, right? So we know that the vagus nerve comes through the diaphragm, that would actually come from the brain from up here, through the diaphragm line. It's also going to impact the lung area and the heart. And so, you know, you can even just wave your hand like this. So, so a woman who I studied with, who is, her name is Lynn Booth, and she's employed by the largest elder care facility in the UK. And she was flying to Seattle to, to teach a class. And a little girl on the airplane was turning blue, what we call cyanotic. So she was having an asthma attack and she was gasping for breath. And they called for a doctor on the plane or a nurse, no medical professional. So Lynn went up and said to the mom, do you mind if I show your daughter or something? So that, that hopefully will help her. So Lynn showed her what we call the diaphragm wave. Okay, just having your fingers in there like this. And Lynn waved her hand like this and the little girl did it and her color started to return. And Lynn said, like every tw once every 20 minutes, the little girl would get up from her seat and come and find Lynn's seat and just wave at her like this. So, so palm calm, fingers in the crease to help you breathe deep. A really nice way to calm yourself down. Appreciation and other positive emotions also have been shown to help the heart. So here's heart rate frustration. And here's, look at this beautiful rhythm of when someone is in appreciation. There's a heart breathing exercise. We're kind of running out of time. I'll send the link to this. You know, it can be as simple as remembering a time that you felt good and trying to re-experience that feeling, focusing on the good feeling as you breathe through the area of your heart. It could be a, a, a feeling of appreciation, especially for your heart, pumping four times through vessels, four times the circumference of the earth. So make a practice of just taking a moment to be grateful, appreciative, thinking of a special, it might be a person, special person or a pet or a place you enjoy, an activity that was fun. So these are the photos of Masaru Emoto. He, uh, he would photograph water crystals. And I talked earlier that water is 70% of our body. So this is a water crystal with heavy metal music played to it. This is with the words, you make me sick, I'll kill you. This is Adolf Hitler exposing the water either to the name or this is Mother Teresa. Look how beautiful this crystal is by comparison. Love and appreciation. Again, gorgeous, intricate crystal. And thank you. So imagine 70% of your body like this water can really imprint Water is amazing. One of my Danish trainers, uh, Peter Lund Fransen, um, did an entire seminar about water. It has like 30 properties that nothing else has. It's, I could, again, I could do a whole, um, you know, session on just water, but, um, but knowing that um, using positive words, positive thoughts really does make a difference on a physiological basis, as well as simply smiling really releases a cascade of chemicals that would make you smile. So, you know, you wake up grumpy in the morning, just put a smile on your face and see if it makes you feel better. Um, there are on this HeartMath in, uh, Institute website, heartmath.org, they have 
a bajillion resources. They have courses, they have videos. Some of them are for children. Um, you can download the Science of the Heart book on their website. It's a fabulous resource. This is an acupressure point. I studied Jin Jin Do, body, mind, acupressure. So I sometimes like to throw in acupressure points. And this is heart seven. And it addresses supposedly, it's called spirit gate, all symptoms of the heart. So right at the fold in the wrist, under the pinky finger, gentle but firm pressure while breathing in a relaxed way. Again, here's that recommendation to breathe. So just a quick recap, we had that vagus nerve, the basic exercise, right? Looking to the left, looking to the right, then head straight ahead, eyes to the left till you yawn, sigh or swallow. We have the vagus nerve, the reflex point right here in the conga of the ear. We have the solar plexus point for relaxation, palm calm. And we have the diaphragm wave, fingers in the crease to help you breathe deep. The two books, Stanley Rosenberg, Accessing the Healing Power of the Vagus Nerve and Breath by James Nestor, and then the HeartMath Institute resources. And then the breathing exercise, especially the four, seven, eight. James Nestor actually mentions this in his book. And I just saw another book today that also referenced Dr. Wiles four, seven, eight breathing exercise. Okay, so we have a couple of minutes for questions. I believe three minutes, okay. <laughs> I'll stop sharing the screen, okay. Well, folks, don't be shy. You're welcome to enter your questions into the chat box and unmute yourselves. And I'm gonna go check Facebook Live to see if there's any questions. Thank you all for coming. I hope this was useful. Um, and, um, and you've got some tools now. I didn't wanna give you too many reflexology points. It's just, let's just keep it simple. Um, and believe it or not, just relaxing the diaphragm um, and using that vagus nerve point in your ear. Again, the vagus nerve is key, key, key to that rest and digest uh, and repair that we need mm -hmm. a respite from fight or flight or freeze. Yeah, especially in this day and age. <laughs> well, it's estimated that the figure used to be 70% of all doctor visits were stress related. Now they're saying as many as 90% all doctor visits are stress related. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. So anything that we can do to reduce our stress like vagus nerve point, like pom com, um, will will have big ramifications for such small actions. And then, of course, eating well, sleeping well. I am doing a a class on sleep on um, March fifteenth, and um, and that is I uh, read the book Why We Sleep um, by Matthew, whose last name escapes Walker. me. Walker. Yeah. Walker. Um, and it, it was an eye-opening, pardon the pun, um, it, read. Uh, so some really remarkable information about the role of sleep. So again, eating, sleeping, drinking water, stay hydrated, and enjoy. Exactly. You got you to gotta bring joy into your life, like how you were saying, you know, start out your day with a smile on your face. You never know where it might lead. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Oh. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you to everyone who's attended. And I'll, I'll send the links to Elizabeth to post on the Facebook page. Wonderful. I was wondering on the breathing thing, uh, the one that's the four, seven, eight, was that specifically for a certain thing like anxiety or just in general? Anxiety, any, anything in general, yes. And anxiety, yes. Because once you start that breathing pattern, your body can't be in fight or flight. Oh, okay. Your immediate, it's like flipping a switch. 
to put yourself into rest, digest, and repair. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Wonderful. Yay. Well, let's say goodbye to all of our Facebook Live friends. Goodbye, Facebook Live friends. Thanks again, everyone. Yeah, thank you very much. This is very good.